changing a Worcester Bosch heat cell or heat exchanger. Um, my name's Alan Hart and I've got one of the guys from Worcester, a Worcester engineer, and he's just done some videos for us to show us how to change a heat cell on a Worcester Bosch boiler. There's also quite a lot of tips and, and, and stuff in this as well. Um, the footage is, it's not the best footage, but um, he's tried to do it just with his phone. So, but the actual content of the video is absolutely amazing. So please bear with it. There's lots and lots of good bits in it. Um, so yeah, let's uh, I'll pass you over to Paul. Good morning. My name's Paul Kelly, Worcester engineer. I've come to change an heat exchanger on an RI today. Just to show you how bad things can be if not serviced correctly, if not checked. As you can see, heavy lot of corrosion around the boiler and I've got the dubious task of changing the heat cell today. So I'll crack on with it and let you know more. Right, I'm about to drain the system down. Uh, there's one thing that can really help you on open vented systems, is this thing here. So normally call them a rad valve change kit, but you can use them to change three ports. You can use them to change uh, a lot of water carrying parts like a pump, for example. Uh, the best way to do it, as I've always been taught, you go cold feed first, then vent, and then vice versa when you refill the system. What this does, it stops the water from the tank, creating downward pressure. And with the vent being bunged as well, it creates a vacuum inside, so the water's held there and it saves you a lot of time when you're, when you're draining anything down. So first off, we'll start with putting one of the plugs in the cold. All you do, you find your cold feed. Excuse the light because I'm on a head torch. You basically put the bung in the cold feed and you rotate. So it makes a seal. Make sure that's in pretty tight. Next thing you do is to bung your vent. You've only got a Jubilee clip on it and you've got like a like a seal there which goes over your vent. So all you do, you put it over your vent like so, tighten up your Jubilee clip and that'll create a vacuum and it saves you hours on draining down. This is a boiler draining down. You drain it from the right hand side, it's just got a air pip, like an air pip which will fit a vent key. Small bore hose into your bucket with the bung kit. That's the amount of water that I've got drained off from the boiler. Luckily this boiler is up on the highest level, so what comes down from the cold feed, the vent and whatever, with the bung kit creating a vacuum. There's not a tank full of water coming down onto the system. So basically, everything what's just above in the pipe work, what's in the boiler, is drained down and that's what's in the bucket. So you can save yourself a lot of time when you're changing parts. If it's an open vented boiler, it's dead easy to do it with a bung kit. Next is taking out the fan assembly and the gas train, what we call the banana. <laughs> it's quite straightforward. Start off the split pin on the gas valve. Pull the split pin out. It's the split pin. Take that out. And normally the gas valve, the gas pipe just pushes straight out of the gas valve like such. Then you've got on the top a 13 mil nut, which you undo. It's anti-clockwise, obviously, like any other thread. was like such. Obviously I've done my electrical checks, I've isolated everything. There you go. That's the captive nut there. Undo your electrical leads just there. The 
and then you'll find that you can move the banana or the fan assembly, move it, you rotate it to the right, to the slot, it's a bit harder on one end, but then you just lift it straight out your fan assembly, like such, lift that out, that comes out in one. Next is removing the ETA exchanger itself. You've got a top connection, which is a flow, flow connection. I've opened that just to help the drain of the boiler. All you've got to do is pull that down. There's a split pin and you pull that off. There's an O-ring on the ETA exchanger there. So you take that off there, that's that free ready to go. And down the bottom, You've got this big thing here, people think it's watertight, it's not, it's just a securing nut. It's anti-clockwise, off that comes. And there's a plastic nut. Obviously there's a lot of water inside this heat exchanger, so I'll do that up quickly. That's just a securing nut, and then you've got the return connection. That's just, it's quite easy, just finger tight, you move that connection round like that comes into a slot and you pull that down basically you pull that down that comes free under your nut there on your return connection and you pull the pipe straight out the e changer and then that's your plumbing connection has gone out of your e changer that's the trap removed I'm just catching the water in my bucket because uh, inside the combustion chamber it's absolutely riddled with water so I took the trap off uh, and inside here the heat exchanger you undo the flue way which is the grey bit there that's the flue way you undo that and you twist it to the left to give you enough room to get clearance to get the heat exchanger out and at the top you've got like a bracket there's a bracket with like a slot in it and inside the slot A bit hard to see because my I've only got an iPhone camera but basically you lift up you lift up the ETA exchanger and then the actual the actual bracket will come out the slot ETA exchanger will come out in one that's a heat cell removed as you can see been quite a bad leak from a seam leaked all inside the combustion chamber that there's your bracket on the back of the boiler if you look at the heat exchanger there's your groove bracket there as you can see this heat exchanger is heavily rippled so I'd imagine it's been on a dirty system uh, you've got to make sure that you keep these systems clean because the only old 1.4 litres of water inside the heat exchanger, so any blockage, it easily, easily go fail. But this one has failed by the looks of it <laughs> on the top crimp seal here. There's a crimp seal. It's a water jacket, this heat exchanger. It's, it's a cast aluminium silicate inside it. All the way around it is a water jacket that's press welded onto it at the factory. And the water is inside this water jacket here so anything that's blocked in it it'll block up in no time at all important to have a good clean system on any any Worcester Junior just got this type of heat exchanger here's the burner seal removed I'll just show you something on the electrodes here on the rear side of the electrodes this, this metal plate here this metal plate very important that you fit it reason being is that this is where the heat stress tends to go if you can look there there is evidence of it starting to crack which would mean obviously that that seal would need changing and replacing they get distorted the outline of the heat exchanger in the burner 
is printed on that so you know that if you put this this back in it's not going to create a good gas tight seal so you must imperative make sure that you change this seal every time you do any work on the electrodes or anything here's the burner removed things you need to look for on here is any stress around any welds or anything also you need to look on the underside of it if there's anything pinched or corroded or a slight hole starting to develop you must change it because when it lights it will light with the bang um, because obviously the gas air mixture wouldn't be right so you always make sure that you visually inspect the burner clean off any any residue that's left from the burner seal very important that you check that if you look on here they've got tabs and then later on I'll show you on the heat exchanger these tabs line up and drop in and the burner sits flush with the top of the heat exchanger that's the way that you get the gas tight seal I've seen them where they've not been put in right there's a gap and they cause problems so you've got to make sure that that's correct I'll just show you this before I put in the new heat exchanger obviously you might have this in situ all depends what job you're doing but I'll just show you how to put the burner in this is your burner new heat exchanger as I said about the slots you've got there you've got a little rectangular slot there what that slot fits into when you put your burner in make sure that your baffles are tight that slots in the rectangular one and you've got a nib goes into a hole there that ensures that your burner can't move that's one thing there and also one more thing is when you're changing the sump as well which I'm going to do on this one because the old sump's about battered uh, on the condensate sump or condensate sump assembly or whatever it's two different types um, on juniors and RIs and that and the difference is the trap connection down the bottom here the new style traps siphonic traps fit onto this type of sump there's an older sump with like a, like a round cylindrical connection there for the older traps. So that's one to bear in mind. If ever you need to change a heat exchanger and the sump's gone, make a note of the sump assembly because it can easily kick you if you haven't got one. Um, it's quite straightforward. You've got a seal goes on the sump like that and you've got four four connections there that fit on the bottom of the heat exchanger pretty straightforward just make sure that that seals on tight and it clips on it clips on tight because obviously it's a gas carrying part even if it's flue gases not natural gas but it's the most dangerous part of the heat exchanger if you get it wrong here's a new heat exchanger all ready to go burners in place back bracket with the slot or with the probe that goes in the slot that's all on with the new catchment plate there you've changed the catchment plate new o-ring on the flow connection uh, you put your overheat thermostat on with some heat sink paste don't think you need me to explain what heat sink paste is but what heat sink paste does basically gives the best heat contact you can get between metals if it was just metal on metal it took a long time for it to transmit the heat but heat sink paste it makes the heat transfer faster so if the boiler is overheating it will transfer fast through that paste at the back transfers into your sensor down the bottom got your new sump sump which is fitted going to make sure that you put this seal on a lot of people forget it but you, that, that seal basically gives you gas tight seal on your combustion chamber of your return connection dead straightforward that's your that's for the large nut for securing the border to the appliance and there's your sump sump connection and your flue stack there so that's all ready to go into the boiler here's the heat exchanger roughly in place before I lift it I can't do it because I've only got my phone and can't do it with two hands but you put it in place roughly so it lines up with your flue way roughly for your connections there what you do is that you lift it get it on the bracket it should slot down slot down into those holes there 
for your securing nut and your return connection. And then basically once it slots in, get your flue way in, it's pretty straightforward from there. That's your tits changer in place. As you can see, that's back in the bracket. You've got everything ready to connect up now. So all you got to do is that make sure that you grease the earring there. Give it plenty of grease, some molly coat grease. Grease your O-ring before you put it in. The same on the return connection down the bottom. Basically it pushes up and then you get your clip which then goes in one way and it will fasten. I'll show you that shortly. But that's your to exchange it back in place. That's the return pipe back in place, greased and that. And there you've got your clip. Basically you line it up like so, so it goes flush and then you just give it a turn right and that's it locked off. Then you move it around to your connection with your flow and your return. Dead simple, nothing to it. Job done. Just a quick note on the fan assembler, on juniors and RIs and that. Uh, they had a problem with the gas tube on these. This one's a pretty new one and uh, there's no evidence of it uh, split or cracked but sometimes they split and crack on the corrugated bit here. Um, you find it on older models. Don't worry, it won't cause a gas explosion, it's under negative pressure, but obviously not a good thing. But what they do was to do a pack, an upgrade pack with the new tube, which is, as you see, is all smooth. Give you the code number there if anyone needs to get one. It's a factory upgrade if you're under warranty, but it has, has, has to be changed and you have these clips there, which keep it tight onto the gas valve and tight onto your fan assembler. Because as I say, on this model, they didn't come with it. So they've changed it around completely. Also, make sure you don't detach that white tube, because that there is for your fan pressure test. When you're testing how clear the heat exchanger is, you put your pressure gauge on there obviously some guys put them back forget to fix them to the gas train and then you don't get no fan pressure reading you think something's wrong but inside this red bit if in case anybody knows is your bearing plate it's like a it's like a flat like a rubber flap basically if you want to get in into that you give it a turn clockwise it comes out and you'll see the bearing plate in there if you find you're getting bad ignition, noisy, um, or you can't get it right on your gas ratios, normally that's the culprit, the fan bearing plate. As you can see, that's the new electrode set put in, new gasket, <coughs> new sensor, the old one was rusted in. <coughs> that's all the, all the connections that are there. Return connection in, everything trapping, everything ready to go. Just got to put the fan back in, the mixing tube, and connect up to the gas valve and test. That's your text changer in place. Fan back in, everything back in as it should be, ready for testing. Just thought I'd show you lads this who don't know about it. Well worth knowing. You take the, the cover off the RI. That's the electrical cover. You do all your testing and everything. You find a little peg in there. And that peg slots in this potentiometer just there. The potentiometer all the way to the right is normal operation. One turn left will be maximum service mode. And then another turn left is minimum service mode. Well worth checking because very hard to service. Don't jam a screwdriver in there if it's missing. Uh, you want to try and get something plastic at least to turn it to get your service in mode. What you'll get is your indicator light will flash 
a certain series of lights to tell you that it's in servicing mode. Make sure you don't leave them in servicing mode when you put it back together. Okay, cheers. Thank you very much, Paul, for that. Um, amazing. Next time, try and put Fortnite away if you can. <laughs> Thanks very much. Cheers, mate. Thank you.